All right. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Andrew Hedden. I'm the Associate Director of the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies, and I'll be hosting uh, the event this evening uh, with our speaker and author, uh, James Steinhoff, uh, who's going Hello. to be uh, presenting on his book, Automation and Autonomy, Labor, Capital, and Machines in the Artificial Intelligence Industry. Um, I've got some few announcements up front, uh, and then we'll introduce James, and um, we'll I'll facil be facilitating a question and answer afterwards. All right, first a word about the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies. Um, if you spend any time at a university, um, like the University of Washington, you notice uh, pretty quickly that a lot of institutions are named for billionaires, uh, corporations. Um, at the University of Washington, we have the Bill Gates this and the Paul Allen that, the Boeing this. Um, but uh, th there's one institution, at least at the University of Washington, that's named for a working class leader. That's the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies. Uh, we were founded in the early 1990s by uh, members of the International uh, Longshore and Warehouse Union, uh, which for those who don't know, uh, represents uh, dock workers up and down the west coast of the United States and Canada, and um, is one of the most radical and progressive unions um, in uh, US history and um, was one of the first to negotiate automation um, in the global economy. Um, on the docks in the mid 20th century. So there's some connection between um, uh, between the LWU and what James will be discussing tonight. Uh, if you'd like to know more about our programs, you can visit our website, labor.uw.edu. Um, we have some upcoming events um, besides this one. Uh, we welcome you to join us for upcoming webinars. Uh, we have, we'll be feature, featuring a uh, book that was recently released called Intersectional Class Struggle uh, with author Michael Reagan. That'll be um, on Wednesday, November 3rd. And then um, on Tuesday, November 9th, we'll be having our annual Labor Studies Award celebration where people who've received grants and scholarships from the Harry Bridges Center will be recognized. Um, James was one of those um, recipients last year. Um, we also have an event coming up with uh, uh, scholar Maria Quintana, uh, who wrote, uh, is doing work on called Contracting Freedom, Race, Empire, and U.S. Guest Worker Programs. Uh, we'll have a discussion with a, a labor scholar of Indigenous history, um, Chantel Norgard, on Wednesday, November 17th. And then finally, on Thursday, November 18th, we'll be hosting um, a group of radical Black trade unionists from the ILWU who have a new book out called Mobilizing in Our Name which is about the 2004 Million Worker March that they organized in Washington, DC. Uh, if you'd like to register for any of those events, uh, please visit our website again, which is uh, labor.uw.edu. And we hope you'll join us for one of those or more. Uh, our speaker this evening, uh, James Steinhoff, uh, is, the, is currently uh, the postdoctoral fellow at a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Communication, Culture, Information and Technology at the University of Toronto. Uh, we know James th through his uh, postdoctoral fellowship at the E-Science Inst e Institute, which is at the University of Washington. Uh, and while he was there, he received a, uh, a research grant from the Harry Bridges Center, which allowed uh, James to do some work on this book that he'll be presenting today. Uh, he has a PhD in media studies from the University of Western Ontario. And his previous book uh, was co-authored uh, was titled Inhuman Power, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Capitalism. Uh, so um, we'll, let, we'll hear from James. Uh, he'll present about his uh, newest book, Automation and Autonomy, and then we'll have a Q&A afterwards and we'll have more, more instructions about how Q&A will work um, after James's talk. So with that, um, James, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Let me share my screen. Okay, um, greetings everyone from uh, Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, that's outside Toronto, uh, for those of you who don't know. Thanks for coming to this talk. Thanks especially to Andrew and everyone at the Harry Bridges Center for hosting this and for the, the grant that was a great help uh, that uh, Andrew already mentioned. So 
Um, I'm going to talk about this book, Automation and Autonomy, and uh, specifically, I want to talk about, well, I guess three things. I want to talk about the context that gave rise to this research, and then I want to discuss the, uh, the um, two main goals of the book, uh, one of which is an empirical goal, and one of the, uh, the other is theoretical. So the first goal is to get an idea of an idea of what the labor that goes into the commercial production of AI looks like. Uh, when I started this project, you heard a lot, and it's still kind of the case. You heard a lot of people, you know, a lot of people talking about AI taking jobs away, but you heard very little about the job of making AI. And I refer to this kind of work as AI work, or um, more often perhaps data science labor. And data science, you know, is, is a new field and it's a very broad term, but when it refers to what a data scientist working in industry does, it means a particular kind of labor. And I should note, you know, off the bat here that I'm, I'm not talking about the work that uh, is done by platform workers, such as like on Mechanical Turk or something like that. They do work that's very essential to the production of AI, but that is not my specific focus here. So that's the first goal. The second goal is to use the case study of data science labor to assess the theory of immaterial labor. Um, this is a theory which purports to explain how the proliferation of information technology has or is going to revolutionize work and along with it, uh, the capitalist mode of production, perhaps into a post-capitalist mode of production. Um, but theories are tools uh, for thinking and for acting. And so like any tool, they need to be assessed for whether they are working properly. In the case of theories, they need to be assessed for whether they map onto the aspects of the world that they um, aim to theorize. So the theory of immaterial labor is at least three decades old around at this point. It's used very widely and it deserves to be tested to see how it's holding up. My argument basically is that it doesn't hold up very well that it doesn't map on to the situation of AI work in particular. And I don't think it helps us understand high tech labor in general. Um, I argue that we could better understand labor today with theory more directly derived from Karl Marx. Immaterial labor theory is of course derived from Marx, but I think um, one can do better to understand high tech work by going back to Marx and to some other interpreters, of course particularly labor process theory and what's known as value form Marxism. But I think the kernels of my argument are, are really present in Marx's own work, which is 150 years old. So of course it deserves to be assessed for whether it functions. But my argument is that it, it does. And this suggests a general point about studying high tech labor, which is that it's important to attend not only to what's novel in high tech, but also to what continuities exist with the past. So before going any further, um, I need to talk a bit about artificial intelligence uh, and what exactly that means. So when I, when I say that term here, I'm referring to what's called machine learning, which you've probably heard about. This is what the contemporary industry of AI is mainly focused on. And let's be clear that it's nothing like anything similar to human intelligence or whatever we know about human intelligence, which is not a lot. But machine learning is just statistical pattern recognition across huge sets of data, but it does have striking powers, even though that's what it only, that's all it is really. At base machine learning involves using what's called a learning algorithm to find patterns in data and to generate from that an algorithm called a model, which contains the means to recognize that pattern in new data. So this, this production of algorithms by algorithms is where much of the excitement around machine learning derives. Some commentators uh, even describe machine learning as a sort of Copernican revolution in software production or the inverse of programming uh, as Pedro Domingos puts it. This kind of discourse points out a very real aspect of machine learning, but it also tends to obscure how much human labor remains necessary for its production. So what can they, what do these things do? Well, mainly they are used to analyze data and to make predictions from data. Uh, commonly this works in terms of categorizing a data point into this or that category, 
or by plotting a number of data points and finding similarities amongst them. These basic functions uh, find a wide variety of applications, such that the economists, uh, Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee, for instance, argue that machine learning uh, is a, a new general purpose technology comparable to say the combustion engine or to electricity. Of course, whether or not that pans out remains to be seen. But regardless, um, capital's enthusiasm for AI is very uh, high and maybe continually growing at this point. And capital became interested in AI publicly at least around 2015 when advances in machine learning brought mainstream attention to the technology. Uh, then in the next few years, all the biggest tech companies pivoted uh, to AI intensive directions, including Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, IBM, and in China, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. Even some of the old industrial conglomerates like Siemens, General Electric, uh, Electric and the big automobile manufacturers have now got on board. This is not to mention the thousands of uh, startup companies that have sprung up in the same period. So quite ra rapidly, AI became a commodity after 2015. And uh, you can call it a distinct industry, although you know, it's still part of the tech industry. I'm not gonna delve into numbers here, but by any measure, I think the AI industry is growing and pretty rapidly. As you can see the chart on the slide, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, shows the increase in uh, AI job posting since 2013. And uh, almost everywhere, it's been steadily increasing despite the pandemic. So what are AI commodities then? Well, on the consumer market, there are things you're probably familiar with like smart home speakers, or maybe uh, smart vacuum cleaners, or of course the smartphone, which is probably the most AI intensive community uh, consumer commodity out there. But I think even more significant than these are um, AI commodities, which are software applications sold to other businesses for use in their own business processes. So this is AI as fixed capital. And here there are applications ranging uh, anything that machine learning can do, facial recognition, automation of uh, customer service dialogue, converting text to speech, converting speech to text, all kinds of analytics. Um, you can see one example of uh, how these are distributed here um, through the Google's uh, Vertex AI suite. So this is a, a cloud thing that you can buy AI commodities from, embed them into your website or into your app that you're building, whatever. So how did I uh, investigate? this kind of labor? Well, I uh, did it with interviews. Um, I interviewed data scientists, machine learning engineers, software engineers, anyone who was working uh, with machine learning in, in some capacity. Uh, and I also interviewed some executives at some AI companies to hear from the other side. Um, and the companies I talked to people at range from, you know, very small startups with around 10 people um, to well-known international tech companies that you would you know, definitely know. Um, it needs to be said you know, to talk about this kind of worker that they do occupy a very privileged position in the digital economy. Their situations you know, could not be more different from the situation of the platform ghost workers or gig workers who are uh, integral components of the tech industry these days. In the USA and Canada, at least, the average data scientist uh, tends to make over a thousand, a hundred thousand a year. And, the celebrities in the field can make millions. Um, the global median salary apparently is somewhere around 60,000 US, which is still you know, very, quite, quite decent. So um, they're a privileged group of labor, yeah. And they, because the skills uh, are quite advanced uh, to do this kind of work, they tend to be very well educated. Um, almost everyone I interviewed had a master's, all except one. Uh, and almost uh, half, around half had PhDs. And so with the short supply they're in and the advanced skills they have, they have a strong position against the employer for bargaining and, and that sort of thing. So all in all, they're quite distinctive. Um, but what exactly can studying their labor tell us about the theory of immaterial labor? 
So let's turn now to, to theory for a bit. Um, and of course, we have to go back to Marx's Capital, which was published back in 1867. And interestingly, the term automation is not used in Capital, uh, if you look for it. The first public, published use of the term uh, that, that I know of is in 1948. Um, but Marx had, had noted the phenomenon of automation way, you know, back when he wrote Capital. Um, and he considered it a fundamental aspect of capitalism, even if he didn't use that word. Uh, as you may know, Marx held that a capitalist economy consists of two key antagonisms. Um, there is the antagonism between individual capitals who have to compete against one another. But then there's also the class antagonism between labor and capital as such. And both of these antagonisms drive individual capitalist firms to increase their productivity. And as Marx pointed out, and as it remains true today, one of the best ways for them to do that is with machines to augment or replace labor. Um, but capital is not the only important keystone book here, at least uh, not for me. The, the other keystone is, is Harry Braverman's uh, amazing 1974 study, Labor and Monopoly Capital, The Degradation of Work in the 20th Century. Um, if you haven't read this and you're interested in labor, you, you probably should. Uh, in this, the study, Braverman investigates the rise of scientific management or Taylorism, and he shows how its principles have been applied by capital since the late 1800s um, to increase control over, de-skill, and sometimes automate labor processes in all kinds of industrial uh, and office work. So Braverman shows how an interesting progress, uh, process on the way to automation. He shows how before, um, before machines are introduced to say replace or augment labor, labor processes have to be studied and then and broken down into their constituent parts by management. Once that's, down, uh, once that's done, then management can establish a sort of best way to do each part of the process. And then it becomes possible to distribute the tasks among less skilled and, and cheaper workers and also to produce machines to perform those functions. So the takeaway from Braverman uh, for me is that the automation of a labor process has to be preceded by uh, this act of codification. And codification has historically been achieved in a number of ways, but the Taylorist method of uh, time motion study, the last slide showed, um, it's only one way, right? In the, the 70s, uh, 80s, and 90s, when uh, AI was first getting commercialized, uh, there was this, this practice uh, called knowledge engineering, uh, where knowledge engineers would aim to codify cognitive labor processes by interviewing workers, uh, observing them, and then encoding the, what, they, what they gathered from them into AI programs known as expert systems. And it was around this time that uh, Marxist thinkers also began to take note of AI and to start studying the new kinds of software work that were emerging around computing machines. And in general, the consensus at that time was that the, the processes of degradation that Braverman noted um, were also happening in, in this new field of software work. However, um, some more recent Marxist studies of software work, or Marx inflected at least, uh, have, have seemed to change their tune. Um, in the labor process literature, there is a, what seems to be the popular view to me is that software work has qualities which render it resistant to codification and thus to automation. According to one analysis of software production uh, on the slide here, quote, at every stage, human rather than machine intervention predominates. Each project requires fresh planning and decisions. This reality stands in sharp contrast to the one best way of tailorized work settings. And they go on to describe software production as, quote, dependent upon the skills of individuals and the synchronization of their disparate efforts, but in ways that management cannot implement from above. Therefore, software production, they argue, is best understood as a craft and a craft that can't be codified. It's thus not threatened by de-skilling and automation, they argue, because, quote, to fully standardize computer programming would require seemingly omniscient knowledge of both the emergent problems and the associated solutions that pop up in the course of this kind of labor. 
Now, this evaluation of software production is echoed by another very different line of Marxist thought, the one I mentioned earlier. Um, it's the theory of immaterial labor, which is promoted by the group uh, or, or theoretical line of thought called post operismo or post workerism. Um, immaterial labor theorists argue that, as I said, the proliferation of information and communication technology is causing a socioeconomic paradigm shift in which labor uh, becomes dispersed via networks and increasingly in immaterial. It's immaterial because it involves tons of communication, creativity, affect, and because it's dispersed. Maurizio Lazzarato describes it as, quote, post Taylorist production. And Hart and Negri advise that we should not be too concerned about a quote unquote digital Taylorism because, they say, there are innumerable digital tasks that machines cannot complete. So, according to these theorists, the technological balance of power that historically favored capital uh, with widespread computation, uh, computa computa computization of work, uh, now shifts in favor of labor, which becomes able to produce uh, value and such without capital's organizing control. Hart and Negri go on to say that immaterial labor becomes increasingly abstract from capital. It has a greater ability to organize production itself autonomously, particularly in relation to machines. So in, the, in this, this uh, scenario of material labor, they imagine capital being reduced from the sort of overlord to a, to a parasite uh, and a capital in this, in this situation can only reproduce itself by appropriating the products that labor produces on its own. Thus, they, they, they see in this proliferation of information technology uh, the, the germ of a post-capitalist society. So where do they get this idea from? Um, well, it also comes from Marx. Uh, and in fact, it comes from a passage from Marx's Grundrisse, often called the Fragment on Machines, um, which is an intriguing passage. I'd just briefly like to discuss it. In, in this passage, Marx describes a speculative, highly automated production scenario in which the direct labor of workers becomes, quote, indispensable, but subordinate uh, compared to the general scientific labor and technological application of natural sciences. So in this scenario, most of the production process is automated. Uh, it's done by machines. And uh, Marx describes the human being as coming to relate to it as a, as a watchman or a regulator. Right, uh, these machines are introduced by capital to reduce labor time to a minimum, Marx says. But since, according to his theory, value derives from la labor, in so doing, capital undermines the conditions for its own existence. In automating, capital thus, quote, works toward its own dissolution, as Marx puts it. Um, now, there's a big debate about how to interpret the fragment on machines, but I'm not going to get into it. But for people who endorse the theory of immaterial labor, uh, it's generally taken as a prediction or a prophecy of sorts. Hart and Negri say that, quote, what Marx saw as the future is our era. This radical transformation of labor power and the incorporation of science, communication, and language into productive force have redefined the entire phenomenology of labor and the entire world horizon of production. Okay, so, that's enough with the theory. But data science work ought to be at the forefront of this radically transforming or transformed horizon of production. This kind of work ought to be the epitome of immaterial labor. So um, we can ask the question, is it accurate to call data science work post-Taylorist? I think that's more precise, better, easier to understand than saying immaterial. Um, in short, my argument is that no, we can't. Um, my research shows that data science work is undergoing uh, processes of de-skilling and automation that are familiar to past analyses of labor processes. So to really understand uh, how that's happening, we need to look in detail at the machine learning labor process. Um, and that does occur in the book, but um, that's going to be too detailed to go to happen in this talk. 
Instead, um, I just want to focus on one particular quality which several of my interviewees brought up about the machine learning labor process. And it connects, you know, uh, quite strikingly to the formulations of both the labor process theorists I mentioned and the immaterial labor theorists who describe, you know, uh, high tech software based work as complex, communicative, and uh, resistant to being codified. So this, this machine learning engineer I spoke to describes the production of machine learning in, in these terms. He said, there's a lot of dark art to the design and layout of a neural network. You have this expectation that data is going to flow through this graph in some way, and you're going to update these things, and there's some relationship between the shape of the layout of the graph and the quality of the outputs that come through it. What is that relationship? Well, nobody has really more than a cursory understanding of it. We know how to make it really, really, really bad. We know what not to do. And if we want to get better performance, we can tweak it a little bit, but we don't actually have a firm model of theory behind it. So according to this engineer, the machine learning labor process requires experimentation and guesswork because not even the experts uh, know exactly what needs to be done. Each case is different. Each case requires bespoke solutions. This would seem to suggest that the kind of that this kind of work might indeed possess the autonomy attributed to it by immaterial labor theorists and the and the labor process theorists that I mentioned. It, you know how could how could management attempt to control and, and tailorize such a occult labor process, which even the experts achieve only through trial and error and you know sheer experience. Well, um, my interviewees told me about a number of ways in which uh, this does happen and I'll talk about two. So the first is something called empirical control. Um, as you probably know, software work is, is, is famous for non-traditional management practices. Uh, these are epitomized by the posh Google campuses you know, with video games and nap rooms and uh, flexible schedules. Uh, but these, this style of management arose because of the nature of software production and its resistance to being codified. But in such contexts, management is reconfigured, not abolished. And we can see this um, by looking at how the labor process is schematized in different development methodologies. Now consider this uh, waterfall methodology. This is a traditional development methodology from manufacturing. It's a linear process from design to uh, deployment. And this, uh, this was tried in the early days of software engineering, um, but it was recognized as being risky in the, in the context of software because software, the critics said, just has too many variables to be plotted out rigorously in advance by management. And uh, with machine learning production, which is reliant on data, and it's even more uncertain, uh, this, this process absolutely would not work. So um, software production, including that of machine learning, has predominantly switched to a different methodology called agile, which is described as iterative and incremental. So rather than one linear process, agile entails a series of sprints, which are periods of between a week and a month long, in which uh, one small component is to be completed and integrated into the, into, as a working part within the rest of the project. So Agile is a broad principle and it's ramified into dozens of different particular uh, applications. But one popular subgenre of Agile and one which most of my interviewees uh, workplaces used is called Scrum. Uh, the Scrum, like, uh, yeah. And the developers of Scrum have a very interesting book uh, about it. And they describe it as a quote, control practice and a kind of social engineering. So how it works is like this. Uh, with Scrum, you have, a, you have a development team which receives orders on high from upper management, but the team has full autonomy to decide on how to implement those orders. Rather than delegating tasks, managers are, are sort of reconfigured to facilitate the autonomous work of the team by running a, a daily meeting in the morning where the workers report on their progress on a series of goals. But the interesting thing is that the goals are set 
by the workers. The responsibility is devolved uh, onto the, the, the team and they make commitments with one another uh, to achieve the goals that they've agreed on rather than to the manager. Now, the developers of Scrum in their book strikingly compare their method to what else but the automation of chemical plants. Uh, chemical plants, yeah. Um, so they explain that some chemical processes, which are precisely understood and uh, can be precisely defined, these can be fully automated. However, um, some processes you know, we, we lack full knowledge of, and these can only be completed through uh, continuous empirical observation and uh, incremental adjustment. Right? Uh, if you don't quite understand this chemical reaction or you know, how this certain reaction happens, you can incrementally go your way through safely, turn up this, turn up X, turn up Y, blah, blah, blah. Um, so this is called empirical control because it involves you know, empirically looking constantly and adjusting. This is the idea behind Scrum. Uh, and it's implemented through the, these, these daily meetings and the, um, the ways in which the commitments are tracked amongst the workers and observed. But it's also implemented in data science work uh, with a special array of tools, um, including product management software, such as a program called Jira, J-I-R-A, um, which in includes some very extreme like time tracking functions and uh, a variety of options, you know, surveillance options, such as like screenshots every minute for every worker, this sort of thing. So you have this almost real-time surveillance as a substitute for uh, the codification of a labor process. In this way, um, the, the mysterious machine learning labor process can be brought under control of the capital. Uh, if it can't be tailorized, at least it can be sort of finessed through uh, towards a greater productivity. You know, um, you might assume then if, if, if this labor process can't be tailorized, then it also can't be automated. So maybe there is this kernel of autonomy within it. And that is the assumption of a lot of analyses of this kind of work, software work. But um, my argument is that that's not the case. Uh, I was surprised, especially to hear from my interviewees, that their work, data science work, uh, was in fact already being automated at that time. And this is 2017, 2018, when I was doing these interviews. So this is some time ago now. Um, so they told me about something called automated machine learning, or auto ML for short. And these are applications with which automate the process of producing machine learning models through a recursive application of machine learning to that very process. So it's using machine learning to make machine learning. And um, it has the auto ML, this, this, this thing uh, has advanced a lot in those few years since I did the interviews. Um, at that point, it was an experimental project. Um, as far as I could tell, Google you know, was playing around with it, doing some experiments, posting about it on the AI blogs. But now it's the basis for uh, probably around a dozen commodities on the market. It's a, it's a deployed technology. And uh, it is already contributing to the fragmentation of data science work. Uh, some aspects of the, the machine learning labor process can now be conducted by less skilled workers with the assistance of these automated tools. Some even have easy to use graphic interfaces. Some are even advertised as one click. Um, so then you have functions of data science that can be performed now by data analysts uh, who are you know, considered lower on the, the hierarchy. But what's really interesting uh, about AutoML is that it's often being applied to automate steps of the labor process which have not been codified because precisely, precisely because they rely on intuition, guesswork, and trial and error. The, uh, the very stuff that the the engineer I quoted at length referred to as sort of the dark art of machine learning. But AutoML overcomes the, the lack of codification through uh, brute force. And uh, in general, uh, it, it, AutoML works by 
generating based on some existing data about the problem needs to be solved. Um, numerous potential candidates of code uh, that could be solutions for that. Um, and then it subjects them to sort of arrays of competitive tests to determine which one performs best in different scenarios. It'll select the winner and then it will sort of iteratively do this again and again and uh, generate a, a functional option. Um, and so this technique can you know, experiment with uh, and, and try thousands of options in the time it would take uh, human engineers to build and try a few. And some studies show uh, in limited contexts, uh, these algorithms can produce things on human level or sometimes uh, exceeding them. So what's interesting about this? Well, we seem with AutoML to have automation without a preceding codification. So I'm calling this uh, synthetic automation. You, you could also think of it as the automation of automation. And I'm, when I say synthetic here, I'm borrowing from Alfred Zohnrethel's book, uh, Intellectual and Manual Labor, where he talks about what he calls the synthetic timing of labor, meaning when capital develops its own temporalities for, for a job based on its own needs and its own calculations, not on precedents set by labor. Synthetic automation similarly refers to the automation of labor processes without capturing knowledge about that process via the surveillance of labor. The idea is that given enough suitable data, even if it's less directly relevant than that which would be produced by the surveillance of labor, uh, an effective automation process can be produced. And one that's not, uh, as, a, as a bonus perhaps, one that's not constrained by tradition or the limitations of the human form or the resistance of workers who are being surveilled or are otherwise impacted. Um, but someone might respond to what I've just said and say, doesn't the data on which machine learning relies ultimately come from, from humans anyhow, presumably from labor in the context of work? So isn't what I'm describing just a displacement of the surveillance of labor? Well, I would say not necessarily. And this connects to another reason for calling synthetic automation synthetic. And this is that it's connected to efforts to generate what's called synthetic data rather than collect it from the world. Um, and there are a lot of techniques related to this, such as uh, unsupervised learning, uh, reinforcement learning, in which a system uh, is said to sort of learn by experience. What this really means is that it generates its own data. Um, and I don't have time to talk about these in much detail, but I, I will say, if you think about it, it's, it's somewhat unsurprising that capital would encourage efforts to sever the connection between data and, and human labor. Um, if it can figure out how to produce data without getting it from humans, uh, generally companies would like that. So I expect we're going to hear more about synthetic data in the future. Uh, one notable recent example, uh, famous example, I guess, of uh, reinforcement learning in particular is the company DeepMind's AlphaGo Zero, which uh, I think is the strongest Go player on the planet, uh, or which has many, anyways, beaten all kinds of uh, human experts and other machines uh, that are supposed to play this game. Um, but the interesting thing about AlphaGo Zero is that it was not trained on human gameplay data at all. Uh, it generated the data by having aspects of its, its system play itself over and over. And it sort of bootstrapped an understanding of the game uh, out of that repetitious brute force, uh, you know, sheer iterations. So the question is, this, uh, this raises for me and the relate in relation to the notion of synthetic automation is how well such a technique might be uh, generalized to real world labor processes, which are of course much more complicated than even a complicated board game. So um, I think now I should wrap up. Um, so, to recap here, so what do 
empirical control and auto ML tell us about data science work? Well, uh, despite being resistant to Taylorist codification, data science work, uh, as we've seen, is subject to management control of a sort of decentralized, uh, decentralized, deterritorialized, whatever you want to say, variety, and also to this, this perhaps indirect form of automation. It thus seems clear that this type of so-called immaterial labor does not possess the new sense of autonomy that the theorists of immaterial labor attribute to it. Instead, uh, the sector of labor reveals the ongoing functioning of what Braverman called the degradation of labor. Data science is often touted as sort of this, this job of the future, right? And like what you should what you should get your kid to study. And uh, but what I'm arguing is that like all uh, almost all other workers, data science workers are encountering the corrosive effects of uh, what Marx would call the law of value. So that's the first takeaway. Uh, the second one concerns automation uh, rather than labor. Capital, as we know, uh, re relies on labor. It's essential. But um, it always seeks to minimize uh, this reliance or to make it as, as easy as possible for itself, for, for capital. And automation is one way to do this, right? It allows capital to reduce the human component in the labor process. And synthetic automation, I think, promises the further reduction of the human component insofar as it uh, automates the design of automation applications, the automation of automation. And while its widespread application remains a possibility only at this point, uh, I think it's reasonable to assume that capital will try to pursue it and uh, that it therefore deserves to be thought about now. So uh, finally, um, I would just say that in advancing the cause of labor, it's undoubtedly important to highlight where and how labor has and can achieve autonomy from capital, even if that is in you know, minute pockets. Um, but it's also important, I argue, to look at how capital seeks to develop its autonomy from labor. And this should not be dismissed as a mere fantasy. Uh, instead, we need to look at the specific technical means by which capital hopes to achieve this goal, persistent goal that it has. And uh, that's all. Thank you very much.